All right. Um, first of all, a little precarious situation going last. Okay, this is an experiment, so I'm trying a little experiment. You've been sitting for a while. This is going to take 10 seconds or less. So I want you to stand up, shake the hand of someone you don't know, and sit down within 10 seconds. Quick. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Thank you for that. If you don't remember what I say, you remember that exercise. <laughs> um, there's a lot of, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about Ed Davis. Ed Davis, you should know, for those who don't, I'm sure all in this room do, he's one of the most respected people in the business. I've met him about a year and a half ago, and uh, he's been a huge influence on me. So uh, thanks, Ed, for that being who you are for the younger chiefs. And you're my brother, by the way, so. <laughs> I'm just um, I, I do have some thoughts uh, about uh, the future of policing, where we're at, and some of the things we need to focus on. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, community policing. You know, it's been around for about 30 some years now. Um, and, and I think it takes on several different iterations depending upon where it is you're looking at it to be instituted. I think if you have 10 different chiefs up here and ask them what community policing means in their particular jurisdictions, you get 10 different explanations of what that is. And I think it's, part of that's intentional. But I think there's something about community policing in the current iteration that's a bit limiting. I think it's still primarily transactional. I think it's primarily instituted in this kind of form. I come to you. I have a conversation about what you need, and I look to, to deliver on your expectations. And what the research has, has showed us about community and, and about collective efficacy and what really is the underpinnings of a thriving community is that's not enough. And, and we know that intuitively. One of the first things I realized as a young patrol officer in Minneapolis, and I, and I came up through Minneapolis during the worst period of violence in the history of that city, is some of the questions I ask myself on some of these calls is, why am I here? I mean, this is not what I signed up for. This is a kid trouble call. It's a loud music call. Why are people so dependent upon the police to solve every single issue? And what I've learned over my short 19 years is that the informal social controls have atrophied so much in our communities that the only, only recourse is 911. That's the only recourse. Okay, a little bit about Brooklyn Park. Brooklyn Park, by the way, is the second most diverse city in the state of Minnesota. Next to our, our sister city, Brooklyn Center, the core city, Minneapolis, St. Paul, third and fourth, respectively. Um, in talking about community policing, in the future of it, I think we need to lop off the word policing altogether. I think the future of community policing is community building. I think it has nothing to do with police at all. I think we play our role, right? We, we have, we have the, the monopoly on course of force. There's things only we can do, but we're not the answer to all things. In our city, in our small city of 80,000 people, we have about 70,000 calls for service a year. We have about 9,000 crimes. You add on 5,000 medicals, maybe 12,000 traffic stops, it's about 40,000 calls for service that have nothing to do with a reportable crime. That's a little bit, that's over-dependence on the system. The things we know, and much of my philosophy is based upon the work of Peter Block and John McKnight, who've really studied for almost 20 years the social fabric of communities. And what we know is that that, those relationships that bind us together, is, is, the, critical, is the critical thing, the critical component of a community that's successful. And when those things don't exist, a community doesn't have a chance. I mean, just think for a minute about what a thriving community looks like. People reminisce all the time about um, a small town. In a small town, right, breakfast is an event. It's not about the steak and eggs, right, they have it every morning. It's about people coming together and having a conversation about their needs and about how they can come together to fulfill those needs. So community building is something that focuses on not just the problems, we're good at that. Let's talk about the problems, talk about the problem. It focuses on the possibilities, and it, and it gets to those things through the art of conversation, and the emphasis on relationships matter. The three things that, that community building people, like myself, really focus on. 
The fact that within our communities, we're communities of abundance, that we have what we need within our community. The second thing is, is that you access those, that abundance through relationships, and lastly, it's not serendipity. You have to go out and actively seek to engage folks. Okay, I'm making a little bit of a case here. There's two reasons why I believe that community building is the next iteration of community policing. In fact, it's a whole new way of thinking altogether. The first is the financial crisis, right? Even the most optimistic economists out there has all but a bleak forecast for local governments across this country. So to think if we can continue to put cops on the dots, it's not going to happen. Look at Camden, New Jersey. Look at New York. Look at cities across the nation where at a minimum they're not filling vacancies and at a maximum they're laying, off, laying people off. That's real, right? So this, so this sense that we can't, that we have to figure out a way to police better, I, I think is, is not gonna hold up over time. 18,000 police departments in this country, 10 years from now there won't be 18,000 police departments in this country, I can guarantee it. That's my prediction. We can't afford it. We're always, already, already looking at ways to regionalize our services. And that's gonna continue. Secondly, it's about the demographic shift in this country. I heard now that 2042 is a, is a demographic tipping point that's going to that's occur. Now, what that means is a whole lot of cities have become a lot more diverse really quickly. And there's one thing that reduction in crime does not correlate with, and that's a, re a reduction in isolation and fear. And, and I, would, I would suggest that typical community policing strategies don't address that very well. Here's a typical community policing interaction. I'm community police officer Mike Davis. I come, I, I come to this block and I say, ma'am, sir, I'm community police officer Mike Davis. I'm here to serve you. Tell me what you need from the police department. Okay? Well, these kids walk down the middle of my street. You know, and, and I just, I can't, I, I take my kids are afraid. I can't walk my dog and, and I, I'm, just, I'm just afraid. What do you want me to do? Well, ma'am, <clears throat> I want you to call 911 and someone will respond to help you. Okay, so they call 911, cops respond, not the same officer, because typically community police units are insular, right? And the officers come and, and throw what typically is a Hispanic or black kid over the hood of the car, and of course find nothing, because the majority of stops yield nothing. And so what have we accomplished through that? We feel good because we've responded to the community concerns. But what have we truly accomplished? We reinforce, reinforce the isolation and fear of that resident. And by the way, we further reduce our credibility with the kids we've thrown over the hood. That is not the future of policing, and that's not what is going to address the issues of race. Police departments cannot hide behind the, the racial fear in communities anymore. Can't happen. We have to be leaders in the discussion about how to build community. In the city of Brooklyn Park, we're starting that type of conversation. Back in 2009, I called a meeting. That's all I did, I called a meeting. And I said, residents of the city of Brooklyn Park, come and talk about your future. End of story, right? And we promoted it, we promoted it hard, but that was it. No guarantees, not more police, not more what I'm gonna do for you, not more of this transactional consumeristic mentality that we know fails. 400 people showed up on a Saturday morning. 400 people showed up on a Saturday morning in December to talk about the future. And I've, saw, I've seen a lot of heroics, right? I've seen a lot of heroics in my time as police, as, as a police officer through chief. But one of the most beautiful things I saw that morning, because we set it up in community cafe style, where people would sit around round tables and talk, is I observed people talking to people they would not normally be talking to about things they would not normally be talking about. And guess what? It was about the future of, of their community. And so to date, 700 people have weighed into our future. And what that has taken the form of is a discussion about the possibilities. And, and, and now the emphasis on collective efficacy. I mean, I, I love the talk about systems. And systems have a role in this, to do their role. But we gotta, we gotta put their role in perspective. Schools alone can educate kids. Doctors alone can't take care of our health. Police alone can't ensure our safety. And until we get out of that mindset, neighborhoods will not, the dots won't disappear. The stars won't, won't shrink. And lastly, I'll say this about abundance. There's naysayers, right? 
You don't know this community, so, it's, so, it's so challenged. You don't understand. You don't understand. Well, I do understand. And I also understand that in the most challenged neighborhoods, the efficacy seems to be the lowest. That's the most opportunity. I think the work of Jerry Stern and, and the positive deviance, I think, is, is, is very profound, especially his work in, in Vietnam. And I'll just say this quickly. So I, think it, I think even though it's not in this country, it emphasizes the fact that abundance does exist within our communities. So 1990, him, his son, his wife, went to Vietnam at the request of the government to talk about or to deal with the rampant, the rampant uh, malnutrition of rural children. So they got there, and they said, um, thanks for coming, you got six months to make a difference, and you're out. Okay, so we studied all, looked at all the maps, all the empirical data, looked, and he said, okay, okay, the water supply is bad, the, the, there, there's poor sanitation, there's ignorance about, about nutrition, and there's rampant poverty. He goes, that's great, it's all TBU, it's all true, but it's useless information for what I need to accomplish. Absolutely useless. And so he set out, gathered a group of mothers, and they went out and weighed and measured each child. And they said, with all the factors that exist here, all the challenges that exist here, are there kids that are thriving? Absolutely, there are kids that are thriving. What does that look like? And so he went into those homes and, and, and found out that the way in which those, those mothers were feeding their children and what they were feeding was drastically different. To make a long story short, what he did was, is he found the formula, right? It was a new way of thinking that had to occur within that community. A new way of thinking about nutrition, a new way of thinking about how to feed your kids and what to feed them. But the important part of the story is that the answer was within, was within the community itself. And there's two things that happen when the answer comes from within. It's a practical solution and it's very sustainable. Nothing I can do is either of those as a police chief. We can swoop in and make you feel good for five minutes, but that's not collective efficacy. That's me making you feel good for five minutes. And are you truly feeling good about your community, or are you feeling good that there are cops outside the door or on the, on the, on the corner? Long story short with uh, Jerry Stern's story, started out with 14 villages, went to 65 villages, spread to 2.2 million people. See, I believe that even in the most challenged communities, and if you do this kind of analysis, I think you'll find it that abundance does exist if people were to focus on the possibilities. I believe that. And quite frankly, it's the only shot we've got. We could focus on systems. I think we've got to align ourselves to be better. I think police have to think differently. And we've, you know, stri we've st we're striving to do that as a, as, as, a, as a profession. I do believe the future is like what's happening, and, and, and that's why it's so it's, so, uh, it's great that, uh, that Jim Bierman is part of the NIJ because what he's done and, and Redlands as far as putting a criminologist on staff sitting at the command staff table is brilliant. But I think the future has to change. And I think it changes on the belief that what we have is sufficient and enough and that we've got to uh, come together for a better tomorrow. Thank you.